This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is sponsored by GardenCourses.com. Garden Courses offers online horticultural training for those looking to develop their own home gardens. The latest course to be added is Create Your Garden Sanctuary. You can go to GardenCourses.com to find out more. This week, I'm speaking to Michelle Mason, stylist, designer, author and co-founder of Mason & Painter, a shop located next to Columbia Road, which specialises in furniture, homewares and plants. Michelle's latest book, Flower Market, Botanical Style at Home, is a mouth-wateringly beautiful and inspirational guide to styling your home using plants and cut flowers. I begin by asking Michelle about her botanical career to date. Yes, of course. Well, my background actually is, I've, I've got two art degrees. My first degree was illustration and my second was screen-based media. So I guess I, you can you can say I've always that had that artist's eye, I suppose, you know, in that, you know, I've lo- always loved playing with colour and shape and form and texture. That That is very much part of, of where I've come from, my background. And uh, and then I, I I worked for for quite a while in um, in industry doing those things to, as a designer and then as a as a web developer web designer and animator and then I decided to go freelance and produced um, textiles and uh, images for ceramics and then decided to go into the vintage shop um, with a friend uh, a long time friend and we um, we did it as a sort of back up to our day jobs and um, my then business partner decided to leave three years ago to concentrate on his day job um, where I sort of carried on and, and did this uh, with the shop and so the styling that that aspect of it really comes from just having the shop really as, as you know shop displays making it look nice making it look attractive so that people would want to come in and because of where it is it's right on Columbia Road where we have the weekly flower market it's it's an automatic sort of audience if you like um, of people that are interested in plants and flowers and they come into the little shops along this along Columbia Road and um, because I sell things that people would like to put plants in whether it's an old tin bath or whatever I've already styled it up say with you know this time of year with maybe flock foxgloves or delphiniums and um, made it look nice in the window to give people ideas and that's that's really where the styling comes from I've not ever really kind of worked on a magazine per se as a stylist or um, as a job as a stylist I've, I've just kind of learned it it's you know it's a learning curve like like everything really and I've kind of done it as I've gone along and there's been quite a lot of happy accidents actually but but it is a really special place the market the flower market is lovely we're very spoiled we've got everything there on the doorstep every Sunday whether you want dried flowers or pots of geraniums or greenery there's a couple of well there's more than two there's probably about five really good nursery men and women uh, who propagate their own plants and um, you know you can ask them for advice specialist advice as well and um, and they quite often bring stuff down if you ask for it any kind of color if you if you're looking for blue if you're looking for red you know you normally can find it um, it's it's all there. It's quite a big market. So uh, the styling part of the job is something I really like as well. So I think I think that's I hope that's reflected back back to the customer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it is. If it, if your Instagram is anything to go by, I've not visited the shop unfortunately yet, but it definitely is reflected back. But one thing that interests me, I know some people seem to have a real innate affinity for things that look good and for design but do you think you can learn an eye for design personally i don't 
<laughs> I, I, I think that's quite a hard thing to say, but I believe it's like singing or any other kind of, th- I, I can't sing, I can't sing for toffee. Um, but people that can, I think, I think you're either born with it or you're not, you know, I think there is, I think people can learn techniques definitely uh i think you can learn techniques like say an artist can learn um a technique for watercolor or oil painting or a technique of how to you know there's there's certain elements of design and styling that you can learn you know a bit of height a bit of medium a bit of low and um but i i think that kind of automatic pick something up and just place it I've seen people do it I've seen people I've had my flat photographed a couple of times I've seen stylists come in I've seen them just scan a room quickly and pick something up and place it and it just looks amazing um and and I think I think that is a a, something that comes from within you as I say like I think singing probably does or a gift for music I think it's it it's definitely something that you have or you don't have um yeah does that sound mean (laughs) no not at all no I think you can hone it um but yeah you can hone it definitely you can hone it and you can learn as I say the techniques of certain things um practice definitely definitely makes better makes perfect so the saying goes but um i i think some i think some people really really have it and and i think others kind of learn along the way you know um but um yeah it's um i don't know i I think you've got to really love it as well i know some people prefer other people to do it for them um you know they'll pay a window dresser or a photographer stylist or whatever I know that 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 goes on as well because because um there's there's talent out there so yeah Mm. so for those who are utterly useless at it they just need to get your book and copy what you've done in your book (laughs) I don't think about that I think um as I say I I think practicing you know if you've got if you've got lots, you know, lots of nice things to play with, or uh, or you've got an interest in, you know, sort of collecting things or whatever, and and you display them well, I think that's that's half the thing, isn't it? That's half the story. Um, even putting up pictures on a wall, you know, it's it's how you how you sort of do it and how it it feels for you. Yeah, yeah, yes. As you, say, you know, I suppose it is subjective as well. But um, I thought. It's really interesting because I think a lot of us get swept up in the, you know, day to day life. We're all busy. And I wondered if because what it looks like to me through your book is that you take the time, you take a bit of time out. Obviously, it's your job, but you you clearly love it. But if it wasn't something that you did for your job. I, I wonder if you would still kind of take a corner of a room or just take a really small area and beautify it for want of a better word and I wondered how important it is for people to do that in their daily lives just to just to do something for the sake of it looking lovely I, I think that's really important that re- it's it's really that there's so many people come into into the shop that with really really busy lives you know they work in hospitals or they're a doctor or, or whatever and they they're very time poor and they you can see that they've gone around the shop and they've just and they've also just gone for a little corner it might just be a little ink bottle and I've stuck a dried flower head in it or something placed on an old book with a post an old postcard and they've bought all three things and they said I just look I like the way it looked and I've I've got it and I'm going to do it at home and that is really nice that's really lovely and and personally, even before I've had the shop and before I thought about writing a book, I, I've i always been a faffer. Um, I think that that's part of the, the nature of, you know, the, the sort of background I've come from, the design background. I've always liked to, I'm not materialistic in any way. I, I, there's nothing really in my flat. I don't think that I'd say, oh, I've got to save that if it went, you know, if it went up in flames or whatever. I've, I've never been materialistic, but I do like to be surrounded by nice things. But those nice things don't have to be super expensive or, um, you know, it might just be 
um, a little postcard or a piece of wood I found on the beach um, that's been really weathered or a seashell, just just the way it looks and the way it feels, you know, that kind of um, the texture, it goes back to texture and colour quite often in shape, I think, all the time. But, uh, yeah, I've always liked to have that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not really into loads and loads of clutter, but just a little bit of star, just something to to make you smile and think, oh, yeah, that reminds me of a certain place or that looks really nice together or or whatever, you know, why ever you've done it really. Mm. Yeah. And how do you think we could start the habit? Because sometimes it is just stopping and going, okay, I am going to take 15 minutes or, or is it just a case of like you say shopping somewhere like your shop and being inspired how do we sort of break out of that daily grind and take the time to do something like that and I think that actually might bring me on to another question which I had for you which was um I know you start your work a lot of the time with a theme or a narrative um you know and how useful is that in getting the creative process going yeah I think I think for people that people that say oh I've no idea I wouldn't know where to start then obviously reference books or Insta- you know social media Instagram or Pinterest or whatever they're great sources resources for you know, there's lots of lovely home interiors books and styling books all sorts of different themes you know as well um you know try try looking at that for inspiration or you know your favorite shops um um go to go to the shops and have a look liberty's a great inspiration source of inspiration for myself i love going there to look at the fabrics and things um but even you know even at home if you're just using um like a nice perfume bottle or you know just stuff in your bathroom um just just try and arrange if you know you've got a nice little selection of bottles just t- on a victorian tile you know just nicely arranged something that gives you a bit of pleasure when you look at it um you can start really small put a plant in a corner or or whatever um i always say you know in, in both books I've, i sort of mention the fact that you don't have to go out and spend money. Um, it it can just be stuff that you've already got at home. It could be, it, you know, if you've got a shed with old paintbrushes in or whatever, just go and have a look you, uh, at stuff and start looking at the texture and, and the feel and the weathered sort of, you know, um, items you've got and just try and arrange, just make a little, a little arrangement or something. And it could just be a, a jam jar with its label washed off and uh, a posy of fresh flowers in or dried flowers or whatever you know you, you don't really need to spend lots of money and that's what I I like to say to people just start with what you've got and then you know look at other places for inspiration and if you're looking to obviously change a whole room um look at paint swatches and get yourself a little mood board together mm. things out of magazines yeah yeah, well, interestingly, I think because the majority of people who listen to the podcast are, are going to be gardeners, I think gardeners may sometimes tend to start with the plants or the flowers and then work everything backwards from there. But actually what you mentioned were a lot of things that aren't flowers. So are flowers or plants sometimes the kind of icing on the cake? Should we be looking to, to be inspired by something else or doesn't it actually matter which way around you do it? I don't think it matters which way around you do it. I, I quite often start with um, the bits of salvage I buy at antiques fairs and vintage fairs that I'm putting in the shop. Um, then I go out and I, I look for the flowers and the plants to put in them, um, to style them up, to give people ideas. Um, but, and also... I have been known <laughs> to buy a plant that I'm just really fond of, you know, because I've liked the colour of it or the shape of it or whatever. And I brought it in and then I found a nice pot a little bit later, a week later or whatever, and uh, and, and done it that way. But, um, you know, for, for, to, to all the, the gardeners listening to the podcast, you know, if you do have a garden or you've got access to allotments or whatever, um, you know, do use your you know your seasonal flowers and 
and also not necessarily flowers it could be herbs i love sort of using herbs in fresh arrangements as well you know sprigs of rosemary and um you know thyme and sage not only do they look nice but they also make you know wherever whichever room you put them in smell nice as well and just rub the leaf every time you walk past i think that's just so lovely um having that that brought into the house um you know and if you if you do have um yeah, a nice vase but you know even going back to that jam jar thing um it's just really nice just to have i think fresh flowers if you've got access to them so uh yeah mm. and if you uh, this is going to be a really difficult question i suspect but if you had kind of if you had to choose one container that you could use year round that if you've got kind of a go-to uh, material or shape of container that just looks good whatever you put in it if you had to maybe invest in one key piece what would it be if i had if i had the money to uh, i've i've had quite a few before uh, they are copper copper's very expensive especially the antique copper um and they were used for all sorts of things um just big copper vats with the original rivets on to sort of seal the seam they look really lovely um you can still see the copper come through on a lot of them which is a very lovely warm red color and it goes really well with things like hostas you know all those lovely green verdant leaves um and obviously when the, as the copper gets older, the older it gets, so you've got that lovely green verdigris on it. So you've got on, on the actual vats, the container, you've got both the red and the green. Sometimes they've been used to boil hot water. They've been used as laundry vats or as cooking vats. And they've still got a lot of soot around the bottom. So you've got that lovely sort of black coming through as well around the bottom. Um, I don't tend to overclean things when I've got salvage coming mostly because I really like that that worn look um, and I think that's what a lot of people like as well when they put it in their garden they don't want something to look absolutely quite often anyway um, a lot of gardeners d probably don't want something that looks absolutely brand new they want something that looks a little bit weathered and worn in and that will sort of automatically fit straight in and, and look as though it's been there forever um, so that that's what I would choose if I had the money um, to to do that. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah, they're beautiful. Um, and also, I, I, I'm not going to give away all your secrets, obviously, because you have a directory in your book of where people can source things. But um, I was also thinking, you mentioned things like postcards, jam jars. Again, what accessories that maybe aren't plants or containers would you, wouldn't you be without when you're styling? Is, is there anything you find really useful that you use time and again? Oh, crikey. Uh, it, it can it can be absolutely anything. I like I particularly like um, vintage crockery, um, uh, all sorts of stuff uh, from cake stands to plates or whatever. And I like I quite like to use fresh produce as well every now and again, just to add something, you know, whether it's a sprig of um, spinach or lovely green artichokes and or apples or whatever, as well as the plants. And um, I, I dried out some artichokes. I just bought them fresh, but they dry really well. They go a lovely kind of pale straw color. Um, and I use those time and time again. I often get asked if people can buy them. I have I have actually sold them, but they're very easy to to dry out. You just basically you just leave them, um, and they just dry right out. And they, you know, I I think they just look really nice because they're quite a neutral colour once they've dried. It they totally lose their green, and um, yeah, they look really they really you know they look good styled up. Um, I've got a lot of seashells as well, vintage, very old vintage seashells I quite like to use. Um, again, just to add a little bit more interest with the shape and the, um, the texture. Um, yeah, so and books, old books, that's another thing as well. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I did notice a lot of those yeah, in your book and um, they look amazing, actually. They're really, really cool. Um, so... Also, I was thinking about you kind of, um, you, we spoke just before we started the interview about the flower market where you are, but um, 
how important is it to sort of sustainably grown and seasonal plants and flowers? And if if it is important, what do you do? How do you kind of go about making sure that that's what you're doing when you're buying things? For me, it's it is very important. It's always been important, and I do talk quite a bit about um, homegrown, British grown flowers in the book. Plastic free as well. Plastic free has to be. That's that's at the top of my list. I'm not really into buying flowers that are wrapped in plastic. Um, I'm very lucky where I am. Uh, I live quite close to the shop. There's a really fantastic um, florist. There's a couple of really good florists, actually, and um, both of them are, uh, they source locally, so they get a lot of um, flowers just grown up the road in Essex and Kent, um, British-grown local flowers. Uh, they're called Rebel Rebel, and do look them up there. They're they do really nice um, fresh flowers and um, they also do weddings and things like that. So I buy, if I'm styling a, a photograph in the week, um, I know I can usually go there and buy some fresh flowers. There's also a shop um, on Columbia Road and uh, that's that's called Bahaza and he does really good local flowers as well, very local um, again, plastic free, freshly picked, um, sustainably grown. And uh, think, I think he's open Friday, Saturday and Sunday as well. So he runs on a Sunday with alongside the market. And there are a few um, nursery men and women um, who grow sustainably. They propagate their own. And, um, yeah, so I, I, I tend to buy the, the geraniums and things from a guy called Lyndon. And he's always on the flower market every Sunday. And um, I can supply the details after this. Mm. I can send you the details. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that you could be in central London and, and have all of that stuff available. Um, if, and if you did it responsibly and you know, you ask permission, maybe if you if it was needed. Is there a place for foraging with your kind of work? Um, I, I, this foraging always worries me a little bit because I, I always feel as though I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I feel always feel like a naughty schoolgirl. I have. Uh, I have. Um, I've like. There's. We've had loads, and we always have storms. I live very, very close to. Um, Victoria Park and every time there is a storm um, I go afterwards and get things that are blown off the trees you know like big twigs and sticks and things like that I've got a lot of sticks that I've tied up on from and that dangle from the ceiling in the shop and I've t I've attached vintage bottles to those sticks that run horizontal to the floor and fill them with um, dried flowers but I have never personally foraged um, I always feel as though I shouldn't I know people do um, but, um, yeah, I just wait for things to fall off the trees, <laughs> pick them up. Very sensible. Yeah, I know it is a tricky area, obviously, as I say, if it's, if it's private land, then you probably shouldn't and you do need to, you know, be a bit mindful of, of kind of collecting too much or, or taking stuff that should stay in situ. But yeah, it's, it's, I guess, uh, it's probably enough to have a wander and be inspired by the natural landscape without actually taking anything. Yeah. Mm. And I think if you ask for permission, obviously, and um, you check that it's safe with the local council or whatever, then it's that you know there's there's no problem. But uh, but I I would definitely say do check ahead. Yeah. Mm. So I sometimes have an issue with making something. I I have an issue with carving out the time, and I think a lot of people do. I also sometimes feel that if I was to make a display, it would only be temporary, and therefore, uh, you know, is it worth doing it? Am I going to end up if I use like three lemons? Am I then going to end up throwing them away? If I re I want people to be inspired to listen to this and then to go away and to actually create something and it doesn't have to be a masterpiece but I would really like people to get in that habit and I myself am going to do it uh, once we finish recording. If you could kind of inspire people and maybe set them a task, what would you get them to do? What would you get them to do? You know, go take away from this and to actually put into practice. Oh, that's uh, that's quite a difficult one. Um, there's there's actually um, a little section in my book, Flower Market, um, where I 
give a sort of idea of setting up um, a, a, a photo, well, it was set up for a photograph, but it was just a little vignette, a little still life that was inspired by the Dutch masters that were, you know, the, during the 1700s, um, that painted a lot of um, flowers. Um, and f not only flowers, but fruits and even the insects, you know, everything was there. The butterfly, I'm not saying you can capture the butterfly, but you could, you could arrange some fruit and you could arrange some flowers and some plants, maybe a, a couple of books or whatever, and style it up like a Dutch master painting, for instance, um, or a favourite painting. It might be something much more... Um, contemporary or even a, um, a, a Matisse or something like that, you know. Um, I'm, Matisse always is, is, for me, very reminiscent of that sort of French Riviera with the with the shutters, the louver doors open and the sea beyond. I know we can't always have that or capture that, but, but there is that sort of feel as well. But obviously the Dutch masters, they were much more darker. They had dark backgrounds. They had very – they often draped – big heavy textiles around them and um you know if you wanted to style something up why don't you just see i'm um, just was talking to your listeners here with things like um a nice old fabric um or um your favorite flowers that are in season and a, a, a few old books with nice colored spines or something just try playing with those colors those shapes those forms and different heights as well you know you might have some tall stems and then come a little bit lower to a mid height to maybe a water jug that has a really nice pattern on it and then a bit lower you know you could have a, a couple of nice tumblers or whatever and some fruit around it so if anybody wanted to try that at home you could just try playing around with that an hour or so one afternoon on a Sunday or whatever it's good fun it's very therapeutic it is therapeutic and fun so I hope you've been inspired to do some botanical styling of your own. I've had a go myself and will post a pic on social media. And if you manage to create something too, perhaps you could post a photo and tag me on social media. I'd love to see what you come up with. Thank you to Michelle for the interview and thank you for listening. Thanks as well to GardenCourses.com for sponsoring this episode. Now here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a very diverse family of moths. The Noctuids are the largest family of moth species worldwide. And here in the British Isles, they account for 415 of our 2,500 moth species. In general, noctuids are medium-sized nocturnal moths with plump bodies and dull-coloured upper wings, which they hold tent-like over their bodies when at rest. And due to their reflective eyes, which appear to glow in a beam of light, they're sometimes called owlet moths. The different species, though, are recognised by the distinct patterns or shapes on their upper wings, which are often the reason behind their enchanting common names, such as the grey dagger, the figure of eight, the silver Y, and the antler moth. However, there are a family of moths where there still exists a lot of confusion about which species really are true noctuids, and whether, using modern-day genomic techniques, they should now be split into smaller groups, such as those that have brightly coloured hind wings, the red and the yellow underwing moths. There's also a number of noctuid species whose hairless, grub-like caterpillars live underground and are notorious plant pests, feeding nocturnally on stems and roots that we collectively call the cutworms. And those species that have twig-like caterpillars the inchworms that arch and loop their way along branches as they search for new feeding sites. And then there's the tussocks, with their striking hairy caterpillars, sporting bristles and tufts that resemble multicoloured toothbrushes. So realistically, the noctuid moth family has many morphological reasons why it should perhaps be divided into a number of smaller groups, rather than keep maintaining it as one big family. But saying that, the noctuid species do all share something quite remarkable. It's an organ called a tympana and a flight strategy 
that has evolved over 50 million years to help the moths evade their primary predators, the bats. Timpana are located on either side of the adult moth's body and are used to detect the echolocating sounds that bats emit. The moths then use the sounds to determine the position and movement of the bat just before it swoops and attacks, giving the moth enough time to fly erratically, twisting, diving and cartwheeling its way through the sky and hopefully into the safety of a tree. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.